Hello, everyone. Welcome to the September 2013 Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. This is a study group I like to do every month where we talk about and answer the questions that you send in. I can take your phone calls. I've got a lot of questions that you've sent me throughout the week, and we're going to go through quite a few of them. The, the theme, I guess, if there is a theme for these things, the theme for this particular study group is more along the lines of how do you study for your exam? We'll certainly talk about specific topics, but there were a lot of questions about what tools do I need to be able to study? And people have seen things that I've done in my videos, especially with mobile devices or with virtualization. How do you get something like that running on your own system so that you can do the same things that I do with all these multiple operating systems? And you might have Android, but how do you study with iOS? Or you might have an iOS device. How do you study for an Android? You can't really go out and buy a $500 device or lock yourself into a two-year contract if you're here in the United States. So we'll talk about that. There is a live chat room that we have going right now on professormesser.com slash live. It's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, that's the one I look at. There's also a chat that's over on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube live, I don't see that chat during the live event. You will want to go out to the Professor Messer website so I can see everybody who's in there right now. Hello, chat room. So good to see you there. Thank you for joining me live. There's also a dial-in line. If you are listening or you're watching, you would like to call directly. There's a number at the bottom of that, that window, that video window as well. That number is 855-235-4742. It is toll-free. So if you have Skype, you could Skype in from wherever you are in the world with a plus one 855 Two three five four seven four two. So to to really summarize or get started with with some of the things that we do, if you've never joined this before, this is a study group I like to do every month where we talk specifically about A plus the CompTIA A plus certification and some of the latest things that are going on. It's really something that is supported by you, everyone who watches my live. A stream is probably also someone who has watched my absolutely free video course that is on the internet. You can watch every minute of every video. The entire course is available for you to stream absolutely free on my website at professormesser.com. There are also people who want to take it offline, have purchased offline versions of this. And if that's something you'd like to do, you can do that as well at professormesser.com slash downloadable dash A plus. I also send you DVD ROMs as well. So you get something physical, not just downloadable. And if you'd like to follow this or keep track of it or see the videos that I post, whether it is A plus or Linux or whatever I come up with in the future, uh, you can also help support us by going to pro the professormesser.com slash YouTube and subscribing to my YouTube channel. It's remarkable how much that helps whenever we want to do more streaming and more things with YouTube. So if uh, you've said, well, I like the streaming and I don't have, I'm not really planning to purchase the offline version, there's something you could do right there that really, really, really does help quite a bit. There is a... Um, also a Twitter feed, so every day you get you get Twitter feeds from that. So you can also uh, see the month, the daily A plus pop quiz. I write a brand new pop quiz every day, Monday through Friday. So if you'd like to get that pop quiz sent to your Twitter stream, um, there's also an email uh, list that you can get onto on the Professor Messer website. The easiest ways with Twitter, though, professormesser.com slash Twitter. And occasionally, I send out some other interesting things as well. Technology is one of those things that I have a passion for, and I like to share it with everybody, and that's a good way to do it. There is uh, quite a bit going on this month with the study group, but we already went through a number of topics last month. Those topics are not things that I'm going to repeat again this month because the replay is available on the Professor Messer website at the bottom of the index of A plus videos are all of our study group replays. So you can go learn like last month when we discussed how RAID works. So if you sent me a question this month about RAID, uh, we've already talked about that last month, so I don't tend to repeat. I at least skip a month when I do those types of things. We talked about what are the symptoms of a failing RAID array? How do we fix it? Why is Mac filtering not a security measure? Could I recap IP addresses, default gateways, and DNS? We did that last month. What should I know about networking to pass the A+, and what is a good way to get ready for the A-plus exam? I ask all of those things 
and try to get in there and give you information about all of those topics. Last month, it would be a great thing to watch for the replay. And since the, the 800 series exam is out, we'll talk about that in just a moment. It's been out for a while. The last... I would say five or six replays have been very focused on the 800 series. So if you're thinking that the 800 series really uh, became exclusive this month, but really you could go back about five or six months on my study groups and it is 800 series specific. So feel free to do that as well with those pieces. There is quite a bit uh, with this uh, that you have to deal with when you get your A plus certification. That is one of those things that I think is is important for everybody, but you also have to maintain that certification. And to maintain, you're going to need to move everything to an idea of, of where do I get CE, continuing education credits. Some people will take higher level certifications to renew their A-plus certification, but maybe you don't plan on doing that. There's a number of things you can do. Watching this is also one of those things. So you can always go to the CompTIA website and you have an entire list of things you can go through to do that. So one of those things that, uh, that I think is important, and we just talked about this, is that the 800 series course is now the one that is exclusive. We used to have up to this month, you had the choice between taking the 700 series and the 800 series. Well, now it's just the 800 series, at least for uh, the folks that are doing this. So I have an 800 series course that's downloadable. We just talked about that. But some of the things that are different with that is I have closed captioned the entire course. This is the very first course that I've gone through and had closed captioning and transcripts done for all of them. So if you were ever on the um, looking at a video, you're on YouTube and you've ever turned on the closed captioning, their automatic closed captioning, it's okay. It's not great. It's, 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 uh, it's a little sketchy. It's, it's, it's good for something automatic, but I use terms, uh, technology terms specifically that perhaps YouTube doesn't know about. So the captioning that we do uh, is one that I sent to a group of people that listened and watched my videos. They typed it in. So it's extremely accurate. So it's a great way to go through and see the videos and read along. I also put the entire transcript on the page with the video as well. So that works too. Now, for those of you that have been on my study groups before, you know that I like to ask questions of you. I like to have you vote along with me. So grab your mobile device, pop open a new window, and go to the uh, the website for voting is vot.rs. And the first question I want to ask of you this month is, how long have you been studying for your A-plus certification? So if you've never done this before, this is a good test. We're going to go through it because I'm going to ask you some pop quiz questions later on. So how long have you been studying for your A-plus certification? If you go out to vot.rs and use 975187, it will take you right to the question. If you have a QR code reader, those aren't quite as popular as they used to be, but Here's a good example of how you might want to use one. Those QR code readers, you can pop it on the screen right there and do that. Um, because uh, that's one of the things that I think as we go through the stream, I like to ask those questions and get those of you. I'm going to talk into the chat room. If you're following me in the chat room, you'll notice that there is a kind of a DVR feature on this. And some folks, I think, have not realized that they need to fast forward all the way to the beginning to get to the live part of the stream. So if somebody in the chat room wants to remind people that we've we started, we've got, we've got everything going right now, make sure they fast forward all the way through to the end. That would be really great because it's hard for me to type when I'm talking with you. The chat, uh, the, the, let's pop over and have a look at the question that I have, how long have you been studying for your A-plus certification? I'm hiding the votes right now, but you'll see the options are less than a month, one to three months, three to six months, six to nine months, nine months to 12 months. We've got even more than a year. So go ahead and go through those and have a look and see which one fits you. Where are you in this mix of things? It's always interesting when I do this every month because there's always a different mix of people. So it's always nice to see one of those things as, as it's going through. So VOT.RS975187. Someone was nice enough to put that in the chat room as well. So that's certainly useful to have that there. We've got about 32 people that have responded. Of course, I like this question because you can't get one wrong. Let's see where people are going. I'm going to try to pop that open. There we go. And we have 
Most of you in the less than a month, one to three months and three to six months, but most of you here have been doing this for about one to three months now. So that's, uh, and if you're someone like me, sometimes it takes me a long time to study for an exam or I have to stop what I'm doing and then go back to studying. Something happens in the middle of that. Um, sometimes it may take a year or more to study for that certification. So we're glad to have you on the stream as well. I think that's one of the nice parts about, about this is we cover the gamut for whoever might need this type of information for their A-plus certification. Well, let's talk about what is new with the A-plus certification. I got a lot of questions this month about what happened to the 700 series. It's gone. It is vapor. It is history. If you are in North America, if you're in uh, the United States, if you're in Canada, or if you're in an educational institution, then those exams, these 700 series exams, are no more. You cannot take them. They have been retired. Um, and so if you are in other parts of the world, you can take the 700 series exam, the, the other languages for that exam, you can take up through December. So now everybody has shifted their focus completely. I've been warning you for months, shift your focus. You need to now start studying for that 800 series. Now you don't have a choice. You have to go for the 800 series. Now, a good part about this is the 800 series exam is, is something that is, is almost identical to the, to the 700. The 700, 800, there's probably about 85% overlap, which I think is pretty good. And if you're trying to figure out, you know, what do I do with this exam? Which one, well, I've studied for my 700, I'm now coming back to it, and now there's a completely new exam. Fortunately, you don't have to completely start studying again. Uh, the differences are are relatively minor. For instance, the A plus exam, the 801 covers uh, PC hardware, it covers networking, it covers laptops, printers, and operational procedures. Notice there's no longer an essentials and a practical application. It's really an entire group of topics in 801, including networking, including printers and operational procedures. Most people think of this as the hardware exam. But there's really more to it than that. Uh, if you look at the right side on the 802 exam, the operating system exam, you can see there's operating systems is a main part of that. But there's also security, a lot of great security questions in there, mobile devices, a brand new set of topics for the 802, and troubleshooting. So we've, we've now split this up pretty well to be able to do that. And I think that's an important part of what we are doing um, when we're looking at what do I need to study, make sure you understand those pieces. And later on in the study group, we are absolutely going to talk about those things. Well, before we get to your, your specific questions on the exam, I have a couple people who have called in. So let's go to the, the phones. I don't have a call screener, so I'm just going to call out your, your, your area code. We'll see if we can get you on the phone, and you'll hear a little beep in your ear when I do that. The 316 area code, are you there? What's your name? Maybe you're listening to the stream and not listening to me. It's the great part about having a call screener. We're going to come back to you, 316. We'll try the 207. There you there, 207 area code. Not hearing the beep. And, of course, you could just call in and listen. It seems much easier on the stream, but we'll come back to you guys in just a bit. Now that you've heard in 30 seconds, you realize, oh, we picked up the phone. There was, there was somebody there. I'm going to come back to you right after this question then. Here is a question uh, that I created based on something you folks sent in to me, which was... What type of memory architecture maximizes the throughput? Obviously, this would be the memory throughput by using pairs of memory modules. Instead of using one memory module, we use a pair of memory modules. There's a particular architecture that allows for that. Uh, you're, make sure you go to the vot.rs at uh, 485. I make sure I've got that number right on here. It is 485135. And your options are a secondary IRQ, it's a RAM pair, it's a dual channel, or it's DDR2. So there is the question for the moment, the VOT.RS. And I'm going to tell the chat room here so that everybody is live. And, and VOT.RS 485135. So now I'm actually asking you a question you need to know. This is a good thing to know for the A-plus certification. So there is a right answer, and there's a bunch of wrong answers. So what type of memory architecture maximizes throughput by using pairs of memory modules? And if we look at our options of secondary IRQ, 
RAM pair, dual channel, and DDR2. So there's there's quite a few things there. There is, um, as, as you're voting, this is something that comes up in the A-plus exam, especially under the memory architectures and understanding how these things work with the memory. Um, I got quite a few questions this month about the memory, which I thought was was pretty interesting. Um, we can we can step through the pieces of that in just a moment, but we've got a few more people. I want to have everyone vote since there will be some people and don't don't mention this in the chat room. Do not say it in the chat room. I should probably mention that well before. Do not give out the answer. We'll spoil it for everyone. And if you're watching on the replay, obviously, you don't have to worry about that part. But for those of you that are live, that would be good. So we got 41 respondents. Let's see what people responded with. So no people said secondary RQ. Nobody said RAM pair. What if that was the answer? Nobody got it right. Well, it's not the answer. We And now I, I threw in I threw in one of these answers that's left, the dual channel and the DDR2. Those are things I've heard of. Those are terms that are absolutely on the A-plus exam, but only one of them is right. And I threw in DDR2 because it has that dual, dual piece of it, that pair. So it had the, the number two in it. So I fooled everybody with the DDR2. The actual answer is dual channel. And the, the dual channel architecture is the one where I use pairs of memory to be able to increase the throughput, the, the, uh, the computing capacity of your particular computer. So that was, that's one of those things that um, as we go through the, the A-plus exam, if you look in the back of the A-plus certification, um, it, uh, the objectives list, and we'll look at this in just a moment, that objectives list, um, it's, there's a lot of terms. And you do need to become familiar with all of those terms because you might be asked a question like this that uses a lot of these terms. And as it turns out, those terms aren't really the ones you're looking for. So that's why they put that huge glossary of terms that is in there. Um, pretty pretty useful. The question I got was from Alvaro, Alvaro pardon me, that says, can you please explain how to install dual channel memory? Can you just install all of the memory DIMMs into the slots? Is that, is that how that works? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that it's not just dual channel. The actual term, as you'll see it other places, is multi-channel memory because there's some motherboards that can support dual channel, which are pairs of memory modules. There's other motherboards that can support three-channel, triple-channel memory. And so you put three memory modules in. There's also quad channel as well. I don't see many quad channels, these four, but certainly the, the triple channel, the tri-channel memory is where you're putting three separate memory modules in. Now, the reason you're putting these multiple modules in is really all about timing. Um, the way this works, of course, on your computer is you've got, let's say, one memory module in here. And your CPU has to grab your, really, the, the memory controller inside of your computer, has to grab information from your memory, hand it off to the CPU, and then put it back into memory. That's that, that bus is becoming, that, that's so important. You need that bus to be sending information back and forth all the time. So as your CPU is calculating things and then sending it back to memory, there's an opportunity in there to increase throughput. What if while the memory controller was sending information back, we were already pulling in other memory? But we can't do that to a single stick. That single stick has either, it's either coming or going. It can't be doing both at the same time. So the dual channel adds another memory module. And while you're processing memory and sending information back to one module, we can start pulling from another and keep that CPU going. Because the CPU is sitting idle while it's not doing that. While nothing's going on, it, it, there's an opportunity to increase our throughput. What if we could keep sending it data? That's the basic idea. It works a little bit different on Intel versus AMD. They both have, a, but, but the overall scope is generally that particular idea is that you want to maximize the amount of work that the CPU is doing. And if you can minimize delays and keep that CPU crunching, your memory and your, your computer is going to go that much faster. So one of the things that is important about this is when you're putting these memory modules in, if you really want to maximize it, you really need to have the exact same memory modules. If you choose one that's a slower module, everything is going to slow down. You won't get the type of speed that you're looking for. Everything has to go at the slowest speed of that memory module. And that's why whenever you look at somebody who's putting in multi-channel memory configurations, they say, try to get exactly the same configuration 
for these memory sticks to go into your system. And it can it can work with different configs, but that's really not recommended to be able to do that. If you look at the slots themselves, they have colors on them. So you will be in a situation where you're trying to figure out which modules do I put these into. And these, these colors will help. This happens to be a triple channel memory configuration. You can see there are three black slots. There are three red slots. Well, that makes it easy. You just follow the colors, and you put all three of those modules in there. Very useful to, to have that capability there. I think that's, that's, that's uh, something that people can use, but not everybody starts off with a dual channel or triple channel. You might look in your system, you read your manual for your motherboard, and it says this is a, a, sing, a dual channel motherboard, and you look inside, there's one memory module. You're thinking, I could, I could actually improve performance. Now, it's not going to double performance. In fact, some studies have shown that the performance is only slightly better by 5%, by 15%. You're not going to get 200% throughput increase by doing this. But when you're dealing with servers, you're dealing with number crunching, you're dealing with video editing, you're dealing with gaming, you want every possible enhancement that you could get. So along those lines, Michael sent me a question that said, if you're running a dual and quad or whatever setup you're running, is there a performance hit if memory is added later rather than installing a set of memory sticks that fills all available slots initially? In other words, are am I limiting myself? If I look inside, there's only one memory module. Is it too late? Have I have I messed things up on this motherboard? And how important is it to add matched pairs? Well, we just talked about the matched pairs thing. The the idea of having all of these slots filled is one that will simply wait until you're ready to use them. You're not damaging anybody or, or anything on your motherboard just by using a single stick. Um, it, but it's not going to use that dual channel architecture. And whenever you're ready, when you have the money, when you want to get another stick or maybe upgrade your memory, get two very large DIMMs and put them into your system, well, now you've got the capability for dual channel. So it's going to wait for you. You're not missing anything when you do that. So there are some, some things that you have to kind of think about when you're building your system or when you're upgrading that might provide you with some extra enhancements. And I think that's a, an important thing to consider as well. In the chat room, let's see, some folks have, have talked about those, those pieces of being able to do that. Uh, and some people even said, you know, you install extra memory. And, and this is not a simple thing, installing memory into your system. You have to have memory that's going to work properly. Some memory is, uh, you have to check your motherboard and make sure the specifications for your system. You can't just grab a memory stick from somewhere and plug it in and hope that it's going to work exactly correct. You need to confirm that those settings are going to be exactly right. Let's try the chat room or try our, our call-in folks again. Maybe they're listening a little better in the 316 area code. Hi, are you there, 316? Oh, I hear me. I hear, I hear me on the stream. And they're not listening to the phone. So we're going to try the 207 again. Maybe 207 is listening in to meet on the on the phone call side of things and not listening to the stream side of things and no such luck but if you are planning to call in as well just keep in mind that the stream itself is running about 30 seconds behind so by the time you realize that i'm there uh that <laughs> it may be too late we're going to try 316 again just to see maybe i can catch 316 around are you there I don't hear me anymore, but I hear the hear you there. Three one six. Always a nice try. One of these th one of these days, I'm going to get someone who will grab my phone calls and screen them for me. In the meantime, we're going to keep doing this because I have another question for you. So get your mobile devices ready, your QR code readers ready. The question I have for you is. What is the central virtual machine manager called? There's a there's a piece of software that's used on virtual machines. Uh, what is that piece of software called? I have some options for you. If you go out to vot.rs and you go to, make sure I'm giving you the right numbers again, pop it up on my screen, 556978. That is correct. 556978 vot.rs or use your QR code reader. Is that who that is, Kevin? Is it Wichita that's calling? Is that the area codes that I'm I'm throwing out there? It just shows me area codes. doesn't show me the names of where those area codes are. Now, I want to I want to answer those questions. So make sure you listen in for those pieces. And that's hard because I'm I'm 30 seconds. There's a 30 second delay. So if you listen on the phone, you're going to hear it before you see it on your screen. You'll hear it way before you see it 
on your screen. So I realize that's a little bit frustrating to be able to do that. So let's go over. I have options for you. What is that central virtual machine manager called? I wouldn't be asking if there wasn't a reason for it. The reason is that you will be asked about virtual clients and using virtual machines in the A plus certification. And the A plus certification options, these, uh, these questions that I have, this central virtual machine manager, that's something you need to know. So the virtual machine manager could be called a VMS. It could be called a resource manager. It could be called a hypervisor, or it could be called a virtual system controller. So which one of these is that? Which one is the central virtual machine manager to be able to do that? You can vote, of course, at vot.rs and go to 556978 to be able to do that. I think there's a, a huge amount. Whenever I go to different places during the week, every organization now is virtual. Nobody's putting up single servers anymore into their data centers. They're all using big, big boxes and cutting them up into smaller virtual machines. There's lots of good reasons to do that. And it, it is amazing what we're able to do with that technology these days. So it's important that you understand, at least for your A+, the basics of that technology and how it works. Let's see what you answered. So what is the central virtual machine manager called? The answers I got from you are across the board. Is it VMS? Is it resource manager? Is it hypervisor? Is it virtual system controller? I love these new topics. Um, these are these are topics that um, that you don't have on the 700 series. These are brand new on the 800 series. So that's one of the reasons I like to ask them. The VMS is actually a mainframe operating system that, that was used on IBM mainframes, I think it was. Uh, and it did virtualization, actually, back in the day. Um, that's kind of where all this virtualization started, was on the mainframe side. The VMS is not the correct answer for the central virtual machine manager. Resource manager is not the answer. And virtual system controller, although it sounds absolutely viable, is simply a name I made up. The correct answer, and the one that most of you got, 24 of you got, is hypervisor. That doesn't even sound like a real word. Hypervisor, seriously? It's a it's the, the virtual supervisor that's used. That really, really is hypervisor. Nope, not supervisor. It's hypervisor. So that's a, yet another new terminology that has shown up with virtualization. Ten years ago, there was no such thing as a hypervisor, or, or at least not the concept like we use it today. Now everything is what we are doing with these these systems and how we're using them. And it's the hypervisor that, that allows us to use these virtual environments. Christopher asked a question that said, I'd like to know more about running these virtual machines. What's up with that? There is there's a lot of good questions about this. Virtualization is, as I mentioned, all the rage. That's what every, everyone is using. A huge part of what I do during the week deals with virtual environments and how they work. We're going to look at this in a moment. Uh, virtual environments are there so that I can have one big box. And if you go out to a place like uh, IBM or Dell or any site that has these enterprise computer systems, you'll notice that you can get these enormous devices that have terabytes of hard drive space on them. They have multiple, multiple, multiple multi-core CPUs that are going on their motherboards. They have an amazing amount of memory. And we're talking about gigabytes upon gigabytes upon hundreds of gigabytes of memory in some cases for those. There is these boxes where you just build out this monster PC. And this is the ultimate of monster PCs because what you're going to do is split them up into tiny pieces and run multiple operating systems. So you can give a little memory to that device, a little memory to this one, a few CPU cycles to that one, a couple of other CPU cores to the other one. It really allows you to manage everything in that one device and you manage it using something called the hypervisor. We're going to look at my hypervisor in, in just a moment. But we use something called host-based virtualization when we're doing something like on your normal desktop. I'm going to show you that version of it. In a, in a data center, it is a little bit different. We would use a virtual operating system that's not Windows. It's not Linux. It's not Mac OS. It's actually this virtual OS that is being used for that. Those standalone machines are really designed for the enterprise. And the idea has really been around since the IBM mainframes. And we're talking about you know, 45 years, 46 years worth of information. If you do this on your, same, on your computer, on your same screen, 
Uh, it looks something like that. It's uh, it's really quite remarkable. Um, if you look at courses that I've done, including the A+, but a really interesting one I did was the uh, a course that I did for the Windows 7. And Windows 7 is one that... Um, where I have domain controllers, Windows 7 machines. Uh, I have other devices that have not been configured. And I can turn on all of these virtual systems and run them all at the same time so I can log into the network, talk to my domain controller, and then start uh, deploying an image to a third device. They're all running on my screen simultaneously. Really provides a lot of capability. That hypervisor is the one that... When you start looking at, at how things are managed, whether it's in an enterprise or whether it's on your desktop, you're using this hypervisor. It's designed to manage this very delicate dance between the real resources that you have, the real memory, the real hard drives, the, the real video, and somehow break those up into smaller pieces and put them on your screen. This is a remarkable capability. Now, one of the things I felt was very important for the A-plus videos, the 802 videos specifically, where we're talking about operating systems, uh, those videos I designed to take you along building them out in a virtual machine. So, for instance, um, here's my virtual, let's see if I can show you my virtual machine, or at least the screen of what I have running on my virtual machine. Let me pop this over. For instance, here's my desktop. And what I do on my A-plus videos is you'll notice I start you, and I use VirtualBox to show this to you because uh, the Oracle VirtualBox is one that um, is free. You can download it and use it fully featured for free. You can do dual displays. You can do any, any operating system that you'd like inside of this. And there's no cost for doing it. It's really nice. I have a lot of different virtual machines on mine. I've got one down here. And if I want to start another computer, it starts up in this virtual box and then starts running, in this case, Windows. Now, Windows is running there. It's on my screen. You can kind of see it running here as a box that's on my screen. It's, it's stuck in the larger size that I had before. But I'm running on a Mac OS desktop. So here's the screen. Change this, this view on here. We've got uh, the pieces that are there on the hypervisor, though. I have to specify in that hypervisor all of the things that I want to run. So I have to say, use 1024 meg of memory. Use a gig of memory. Boot from the floppy, then the DVD-ROM, then the hard drive. Uh, here's how much video memory I want to use. Use two screens. You didn't get to see one, but there's another screen to my right that it was also using. Um, I want to be able to have these... Um, uh, either CD-ROMs or DVD-ROMs mounted as ISO files. Here is the, the actual virtual hard drive. It's just a file that's on your computer. Here's the audio I'm using, the network I'm using. So I've built out this virtual world all in this, this virtual environment. And if you've got now a machine that you can use, you've got this set up to be able to, to run your, your VM, to run your... Uh, your Windows desktop, your Linux desktop, and you've got the DVD-ROM to install it, you can set up the virtual machine and install it, and that's what my videos take you through, is that exact configuration of being able to do that. And I think that's that's one of the things that, when you start working in these virtual environments, it becomes pretty, pretty nice to have that functionality there. You can load up any operating system you want to and have it running. Now, with Windows, of course, you have to have the Windows Media. You have to have Windows 7 and Windows Vista and Windows XP to be able to load this. So obviously you still have the same functional limitations and licensing requirements as you have for a real desktop. You still have to have the operating system software, but it's that hypervisor that really does allow you to take advantage of that. And uh, some folks did mention there's a uh, on the Microsoft website, there are virtual labs available. On the uh, Microsoft also makes some evaluation versions of software available. So you may be able to grab a Windows 7 if you don't have that, download it, and then load it into a virtual machine that's running on your Windows Vista or Windows XP desktop, or in my case, a Mac, or even a Linux desktop. That's one nice part about this. It's, it's blending together all of these operating systems now. We no longer have to rely on one single OS running on our desktop. I'm running Linux, I'm running Mac, I'm running Windows. It's all from one place. And I can just choose whatever operating system allows me to do the job that I need to have done. That's a nice advantage of these virtual environments, I think. Now, if you're thinking of doing that, of course, you got to have a machine that can support the virtualization. 
And for VirtualBox and some others, there's some special support that your CPU has to have. Not all CPUs will do this. The CPU for AMD is AMD V. That's their virtualization technology. For Intel, it's VT, virtualization technology is what that's called. Check to see if your processor supports that, and you'll be able to run 64-bit uh, operating systems on your system. Without that support, it may still be able to run 32-bit operating systems. So you still may be, not be out of the of running any completely. Uh, it just won't run as fast as you would hope that it would. The memory that is on here, you have to not just have the memory to run your existing OS. You have to have a lot more memory because you're going to be running more operating systems at the same time. Same idea with disk space. Same thing with your network configuration. They all have to have that same type of functionality. We're going to go to the phones in just a moment, but it, one of the things I like to think about when I'm building out and trying to determine what do I want to run, if I'm going to buy a new computer, I'm going to need to buy one with plenty of resources so that later on I can go into my virtualization and bring up two, three, four different operating systems all at the same time and be able to use those. So that becomes really useful when I start doing that. We're going to try some folks back on the phones. Let's go to the 406 area code. Hi there. Are you there? So close. Oh, I hear some noises. Are you there, 406? Yes, I am. Oh, hi. How are you? What's your name? Martin. Oh, good to, good to have you on the phone, Martin. Do you have a, a question for us today? What type of things would you like to talk about? Uh, well, actually, it's, a, it's one of the uh, situations that I have in my computer. Okay. Um, when I put up my PC, it gets to the... Uh, Windows logo and, uh, and then it stops and nothing else shows up. It, it almost appears like it just freezes up and I can hear the uh, the uh, ladders or the, the hard drive spin, but I do not hear the arms moving or anything. And so it doesn't give me any error messages or no beeps. Just the, the Windows display is up, the Windows splash screen is up, and that's all you get. Which operating system is it? Vista. Okay, so running Windows Vista, you get the Vista screen is there, and then nothing with that piece. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. I it's did, and then I took my hard drive off, and I, I put it into a um, external um, device, and I can access all my files, and everything seems to be there. So you've already done some troubleshooting and determined, okay, we don't think the drive yeah. is necessarily bad. It seems like the drive is working. At least your files are there. And I'll ask, of course, did you did you make a backup of those? Yes, I did. Okay, good. So, yes, I did. so at least we're, we're further along those lines. So it's really something you've already yeah. decided. There's something odd going on with the startup process. Something with, with how this is right. working is not working right at all. Now, fortunately, and I, I say this, People are going to laugh in the chat room. Fortunately, you're using Windows Vista. <laughs> no, people through the years have, have really not spoken well of Vista, but I, I had an old laptop um, that I was using, and I couldn't upgrade it to 7. They didn't even make drivers for me. I had to run Windows Vista on it. Uh, obviously, Windows 7 mm -hmm. might be a, a good solution for this, but let's talk about this particular problem. The benefit, I said, the benefit of having uh, Windows Vista here is that Windows Vista has a system recovery process that's really almost automated. It will go through all of the things that it needs to check on to get things running and, and check to see, is, is this working properly? Is this working properly? Is this working properly for the startup process? And if one of those things is not working properly, it will fix them. Now, you get to this through something that is in startup repair, and it is on your, your Windows Vista um, the original DVD. Do you have the original media for Windows Vista? Well, just the ones I created when I received the, uh, the system. Okay, well, that's that's a benefit. Have you tried booting with those yet? Not yet, no. That's That would be my recommendation for you. There, there are things you can go into and go to a command prompt and and uh, and modify or rewrite things like a boot sector and those types of things, or go in and, and, and enable or disable certain capabilities. But it's so much easier, and it actually works pretty nicely. I've used this a number of times, is you boot up with that DVD-ROM, and there's an option. If you, if you look at the stream, there's even a, a picture up of this. And right, your first option is startup repair. 
And it goes through and checks the entire startup process and determines if it can fix one of those things that's there. The, the other option you might have, and I've used this quite a bit as well, is that maybe it's something you installed. Maybe it's a driver that got updated. Maybe it's a, an application I installed and it did something odd to the registry. The other option that's there is one called System Restore. And if there is a System Restore point that's earlier to that installation, you can simply tell your computer, go back in time to that date. It will change all your configuration files back to that point in time. There's, there may be a, a it's almost maybe a situation too that something has gotten onto your computer, a virus, a piece of malware, or something has damaged the startup process. Neither one of those may work. And if you are in that particular situation and you have your data, it might also just be smarter just to nuke the whole thing, reinstall Vista again and get something fresh and install a, a good antivirus, anti-malware on there as well. So uh, that's a, a great question. I appreciate you calling. Thanks so much. Okay. Thanks for taking my call. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. We've got uh, another person on that line, the 207, since uh, we've got that other line. Are you there, 207? 207's not there. We're going to come back to 207 in just a bit then. Boy, I really appreciate you guys hanging on there and trying this piece. It almost sounded like the uh, the microphone that uh, that you were using there wasn't actually sending information. And you may want to try that. If you're calling in on Skype, make sure you call the nice Skype test lady so you can hear your voice coming back. I do that every time I start up the Skype because I'm always getting something wrong with those pieces. Uh, very nice. Now, Richard in the chat room brings up another good point about virtualization. And this goes into a little bit beyond the scope of the A+, but it's really cool, is that if you're doing something in Windows 7 and you are doing backups and you're saving these backups as, as full images, they save them as what they call virtual hard drives, VHDs. And these virtual hard drives are effectively your whole computer stuck in these drives just like you see in VirtualBox. VirtualBox will even support using that VHD as a drive in one of your virtual systems. Other virtual operating systems will do, or virtual um, software will actually do the same thing as well. And Microsoft, of course, supports those quite a bit. So you can save off different operating systems and have all of those drives available. And anytime you need to get to a file that's maybe on that backup, you simply mount that, you click on that VHD and it mounts it in Windows 7. You go right to your folder, pull the file out and put it on your running operating system. Really a nice functionality. I love the VHDs. And in fact, if you are, if you're using, uh, you're on the Professor Messer website right now, that whole Professor Messer website is in a virtual environment. It's running in the cloud on a VHD. So, uh, everything I do is virtualized. In fact, there's there's multiple Professor Messer servers out there. That's a conversation for a completely different user group. Um, but that is another one where uh, I take full advantage of this virtualization technology. I've created multiple, multiple, multiple versions of ProfessorMesser.com, and I can just grab a VHD, copy it over, do some testing. When I'm done with it, I just destroy it. It's so brilliant to be able to, to use those capabilities. That's why everyone is doing virtualization because it's just that easy. So there's a good example of some of the things that uh, virtualization really brings to the table. I'm going to real quick, we're going to try 207 real quick. Are you there, 207? Hello, hello, hello. 207 just isn't there at all. You hear the buzzing? I don't hear anything in the background either. So I suspect there's a microphone problem there. And I say that because I've been there. I know exactly what that's about. Well, I've got another question for you. Get your QR code readers ready. No giving the answer in the chat room. This is a question specifically for you folks that are here and listening in. And the question is, what's an IRQ? What is that IRQ? And I'm not just giving you a simple answer to, you can't, are just going to determine what that stands for. I want some real answers here. What's an IRQ? You go out to vot.rs to 176956. Is it how hardware interacts with the CPU? Is it a file system format? Is it a standard for memory modules? Or is it a port that you use for input on the back of your computer? Plug into the IRQ port. So which one is it? It's one of those things. I'm going to 
bring up the view, and we're going to look at this in just a moment. So is it how hardware interacts with the CPU? Is it a file system format? Is it a memory module standard, an input port? I think, think back to that call we just had. These are the things that will be asked of you on the A-plus exam. He's, <laughs> yeah, Martin is having to really do real-world labbing of your A-plus 802 to be able to troubleshoot operating system startup. He was talking about Vista, but in Windows 7, that same thing is available in Windows 7. In fact, the screenshot I was showing was for Windows 7. So if you're running Windows 7 or you're using Windows Vista, so simple now to do the startup repair or to go back in time. You know, if your system's not started, how am I supposed to go to the control panel to go back to a previous restore point? We can just do it from your startup media. There was a, a pop quiz I did a while back where people were confused. I don't understand how you do that. You use your startup media. Works right. So what is what is that IRQ thing? Is it how hardware interacts with the CPU? Is it a file system format? Is it a memory module standard? Or is it a port that you use for input? The IRQ port on the back of your computer. See, Kevin's being nice. He want, it's, it's hard. You want to say the answer in the chat room. You want to spit it out and <laughs> say what it is. Uh, but I'm glad you don't because this gives other people a chance. And I think whenever I get a question wrong, I'm working on a certification exam for myself right now. I never stop. I'm always doing some certification exam. I finished one on the last study group. I told you I just finished one. I'm working on another one. But I'm going through, and the time when I learn something is when I get it wrong. And I realize I didn't know that. Let's go back and, and learn about the thing. Let's look at your answers. What is an IRQ? 41 of you said how hardware interacts with the CPU. Two of you I fooled file system format. Five of you said it's memory module standard. Sounds like one to me, but it isn't. And it is not an input port either. IRQs are interesting to know about. It used to used to be uh, on the A-plus exam, you had to know a lot of details about IRQs because when you were using your computer, it was important to know this. Now, a lot of things relating to IRQ, which we'll talk about in a moment, are, are made more invisible to us. It's all happening behind the scenes automatically. So it gets very useful when we talk about IRQs and how they work. I, this question came in from Fred this month. that said, which computer components are assigned with an IRQ? Um, and, and really talking about specific components and what they are gets into a lot of detail. So let's talk about what an IRQ is, and let's talk about what you'll need to know for your A-plus certification exam. First, let's talk about IRQ. IRQ stands for Interrupt Request Channels. Where did the Q come from? What? How, what, why is it IRQ? Interrupt request. Interrupt request. IRQ. That's what it stands for. Uh, the interrupt request channels or IRQs are things that are assigned to all of the hardware that's inside of your computer. This is the challenge, of course, for your computers. We're, we're plugging in all of these different pieces of hardware. We've got a keyboard. We've got a mouse. We have other things that we're using. We have USB drives we're plugging in. We're plugging in all of these different components. Now, when I hit a, a key on my keyboard, how does the CPU know that I'm now ready to interact? It, maybe what we'll do is we'll have the CPU constantly scan every single device. Do you have anything to do? No. Do you have anything to do? You don't? How about mouse? Are you, you doing anything right now? You're not moving? No. Keyboard, you need something? That takes a huge amount of time. Why would we have our CPU doing this polling of every device? That's not efficient at all. So instead, we use a method called IRQs, where the keyboard itself is talking to an IRQ controller, an interrupt controller that's inside of your computer. And the con when you hit a key on your keyboard, the controller says, oh, the keyboard needs something. And it tells the CPU, could you hold on for a second? I've got something for you. And it is this interrupt. That's what it is. It's interrupting the CPU. Excuse me. I have a key to press. Interrupt the CPU says, well, let's process you. Okay, great. I'm, I'm now going to wait for the next interrupt. To come through. Those interrupts originally uh, on the old ISA machines had interrupts that were between 0 and 15. There was no sharing of the interrupts. You had 16 interrupts. And if you added a component to your computer and you it only supported one particular interrupt and that interrupt was already in use, you had an interrupt conflict. Really, really painful. Really painful. You had jumpers. You had uh, dip switches that you had to switch on these devices going in. You effectively had to map out all of the interrupts that you were using in your computer so that when you added something else, you could go through your list of what you were using. Well, am I using three? Am I using four? Am I using seven? Okay, well, I, can, I need to set this one to something different. Uh, really, really quite difficult to work with. 
the PCI-based motherboards that we use today use something called an advanced programmable interrupt controller. Uh, that's one of those things that you run into quite a bit is, is uh, we have so many more interrupts that we can use these days. So the, the interrupts we have now can use a lot more than 16 IRQs, one of those things that, that makes it useful. So the question that came from Fred is that, how do I see these? It used to be we had to memorize the IRQs. Your COM1 port uses IRQ4. Your COM2 port uses IRQ3. And you had to memorize them for the exam. You don't have to memorize IRQ numbers anymore because it's all done for you automatically. You'll notice, in fact, if you look at hardware that's on your computer, you're adding a new card, you add a new network card to your computer, there's no jumpers on it. There's no inter There's no dip switches. So how does it know what interrupt to use? How does it know its configuration? Well, that's the plug and play configuration. We, we've jokingly called this plug and pray for so long because it was so, it, it really didn't work so well right out of the gate. But now we've been doing this for 20 years. Plug and play has been around a long time. We don't even think about it anymore. We just add an adapter card into our computer. It automatically configures itself in the operating system with that card. It talks to the card and says, okay, I've got some IRQs available. Hey, can you use this one? Great. You, they, they synchronize each other, and now everybody's got their own IRQ, and your operating system manages, the device picks it up, and configures itself automatically. Very, very, very easy to do something like that. And if you go to MSinfo32 and you go out to use that, there is a section under the hardware resources that will show you all of the IRQs that you have out there. That MS Info 32 is that system information module that is in Windows. So it becomes really useful to be able to, to take advantage of something like that. Uh, so if you want to see what IRQs are in use or how to see what IRQs in use, you go to that system information, the MS Info 32, and it will do exactly that for you. It's one of those things that when I start running into, and, uh, and trying to see what my computer is doing. It's nice to see that. But Windows is going to make sure that you don't have any conflicts there. So one of the things that um, I get a lot of questions about is, what should I be using to study with? What books, uh, what, what materials are available out there to study with? I work with some folks at GTS Learning uh, that I've partnered with. I've worked with these guys for years. Um, uh, they've, they uh, are use my videos. They integrate into their books. And they've just released some brand new books. I'm going to have a link for you later on that shows one of those. But one of the questions that I had come in um, this month was for somebody that wanted to do more labbing. Now, we showed this virtual environment before. Uh, we could take these virtual devices and use them on our computer. I showed you my virtual box. But what if you didn't have Windows XP and Windows Vista and Windows 7, which are the three operating systems that you need to know for your certification exam now? And if you don't have those, then it becomes really difficult to install them in a virtual environment. You don't have anything to install. Well, what GTS Learning has done has put together these labs where all of the virtual machines have already been created for you. You don't have to go through the process of creating these yourself. You don't have to build out uh, and install your own operating systems. You don't have to have the disk space and the memory and everything else associated with it because they've already done this for you. And in fact, they built it around labs that they've already created. These labs that they've built um, are already, in fact, I want to show you one of these. They're, they're pretty cool. This is me. I'm logged into their labs right now. I'm going to pull up my courses um, let's look at those 802 labs. And I'll give you a feel for how this works. This is almost identical to what we were just doing on the other piece. So I'm going to choose the, the 802 labs that I have here. I know that's hard to read, but they've got, they've got labs that are already set up. If you want to know how to do system administration, here's things you can do. If you want to do file management, here's a bunch of labs already created. If you want to do, uh, let's do system management utilities like performance monitor and configuring performance settings. That's a good one. So it'll take us to that one and say, well, there's three machines we're going to need, a domain controller, a workstation running Windows 7, a workstation running Windows XP. Here's the, here's the devices. They're over here on the left side. So I'm going to power them up. I'm going to click the power button on each one of those. And now what I've effectively done in the cloud is those devices are out there and they're powering up right now. Now, in the meantime, I can go through the, the actual exercise. Let's go through step one. And it takes you not only through the exercise, but it shows you what you need to do step by step. So if you wanted screenshots to really take you through the entire process, 
you could absolutely do that. Makes it very easy to know what should I be clicking on next. I can't find the thing that it's asking for. Well, here's something I can do. And you can scroll down and see what the next one is. Step two, click start, select the control panel, it brings up this screen. So I can follow along and know, okay, I got it right. I've got some feedback that tells me that's exactly what happened. When a machine starts up, here is the, this is a Java-based front end for this machine that does the remote desktop. I was using, in fact, the HTML5 front end to this earlier, and it was great. I didn't have to use any Java for this. I should show you that piece, too. It's, it's really nice. Pops open a new window and effectively gives you that same remote desktop piece on it. But here is my Windows machine. This is the Windows 7 device. So now I'm in, I'm in Windows 7. I'm doing normal Windows 7 stuff on my Windows 7 device. So there's, there's a good example of how I've now got Windows 7 running. It's not on my desktop. It's not in my studio. It's just running now in this virtual environment, and I can follow along and load up my Windows domain controller. So if you ever wanted to go in and play around with Windows Server 2008 R2, here's a 2008 R2 box. Boom, just like that. So I've now got the ability to, to really take advantage and follow through with these exercises so that if you're trying to, to understand more about how to do the networking, how to load the operating system, how to work with these components that you need to know for your 802 exam, a really great way to do it. I've partnered with these GTS Learning because they give me good prices too. So if you'd like a year of this, just a year availability to this lab, they've got it set up and got a great price for us of $99, which I thought was a, a pretty nice a way to, to plan to have all of those operating systems and study guides and um, and step-by-step uh, -step tutorials of all of those things right there. So uh, you might want to take advantage if you'd like to try those. It's at professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. I think they give you a free hour. So if you wanted to try it, go out, load it up, try it yourself, see if that's something that's going to work for you. It's a nice option if you don't have all of those operating systems already running in your environment. Let's... Uh, Real quick, I'm going to go out to, we're going to try 207 one more time. I don't, haven't, haven't given up on 207. Are you there, 207? Are you there? Is there a voice? There's not a voice. It was worth a shot, right? Well, I've got another question for you. So get your, your systems ready there in the chat room. Uh, make sure you don't give me an answer out that on the chat room. There is a question that I have. That's about mobile devices. I told you mobile devices is new in the A plus certification. And here's a very good example of a question that you need to know about these devices. This one is which one of these mobile platforms can download apps from any site. I have a, a few options available for you. I need to pull up my option list. I'm telling you I have options, but I don't know what they are. Let's <laughs> let me pull it up on my side. I'll tell you what those options are. See if I even have them. Which of these mobile platforms can download apps from any site? You go to vot.rs50136, and your options are iOS, Android, iOS, and Android, or neither iOS nor Android. I like that one. Try to try to figure that one out. There's I. Those are challenging questions when it says, oh, it's this one, or it's this one. Maybe it's both of them. Maybe it's none of them. Maybe it's a trick question, and we can all go home. But you need to know this particular one, which is which of these mobile platforms can download ads for all of those things. And these, these apps from any site becomes an important part of this. And there goes the, if you're planning to call in, we've, we're finished on our call-in side. We're going to be taking questions from the chat room from this point forward. So the questions are, are about iOS, Android, iOS, and Android. I mentioned on the 802 exam that you need to know about both of those operating systems you need to understand which ones are out there and available to use and the differences between those. There's not a huge number of differences, but you need to know the differences between them. So we've got 33 respondents. Let me give you another second to get your questions answered. Let's have a look now at the answers that people have sent in this really big so we can see it. So is the answer iOS, Android, iOS, and Android, or neither iOS nor Android? And the answers are across the board. So for those of you, kind of is a trick question, but it's not. It's not a trick question, really. You cannot download apps from any website using iOS. Everything must go through the App Store. Apple has everything centralized through the app store. You just can't go to a website and download it from there. 
you must go to the App Store. Uh, Android, though, allows you to download apps from any site. If it's somebody can put the app on their site and download it from there. There is the, the Android stores as well. So you can go out to Google Play and, and get those apps as well. Those pieces of it um, are, are something that don't have to be centralized there. Obviously, it's not iOS and Android because iOS cannot download apps from any site. And Android certainly can download them. Now, the A+, Plus, as in the chat room, you folks have already mentioned, there is no Windows Phone. Uh, mentioned on the A-plus exam. If Windows ends up getting a nice chunk of the market and starts being used, especially in the enterprise, I would imagine you'll see uh, some updates that might include that. It's not beyond CompTIA to update the exam and make sure that those things are talked about. And you won't see any of the other sort of off to the side. The market right now is iOS and Android, at least in the enterprise, along those lines. There's certainly advantages to the Windows operating system and others as well, but for the A-plus, you only need to worry about those two. So one of the questions from Paul was, in your video about iOS and Android, it looked like you were using virtual versions of this. And uh, that piqued his interest because if you are, especially in the United States, you're very limited as to the mobile device that you can use. Uh, when, you, when you get a mobile device, you're locked in for what usually is about two years. That's the device you're going to use for a long time. So it becomes a little more difficult now to just gather a lot of devices and start using them because now, now you'd have to spend a lot of money to be able to do something like that. One of the things that I did, and you'll see it in my videos, is I'm not running. I'm not showing you and picking up a phone and saying, here's how you do it on this phone. You run it here. Here's how you do it on that phone. You run it on here. Uh, instead, what I did was... Um, was 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 something a little bit different. I ran them virtually on my desktop, and the chat room's complaining to me about the answer. That is the answer. Jailbreaking iOS is is something that uh, is way outside the scope of what really anybody should be doing. I understand why people would want to do it, but that is not something that even applies closely, even remotely closely to the enterprise. Jailbroken devices won't work in the enterprise. They're restricted by the enterprise manager. So you'll never see somebody in an environment like an enterprise running a jailbroken iOS device because you can download things directly from other sites, infected, and then obviously security issues and really control issues associated with that. Uh, when you work with an enterprise, there, there are specific the pieces of software and hardware called mobile device managers, MDMs. These mobile device managers are designed to hook into these mobile devices and allow the administrator to control them. Um, it's this weird world we're in where we used to have our, our, our employer used to buy our phone for us. Some of you kids may not remember this, but you used to get your phone from your employer. And that's because your employer could manage that device. One of the things that we do now, now at this bring your own device phase of whatever we're doing is now it's this, this balancing act where I can, I have my device and I'm bringing my device to work, but I'm also allowing my employer a bit of control over that device. And that's an incredibly important part for an enterprise, especially from a management of the device. If you lose it, how do they manage getting it back to you? And secondly, security. How do they make sure that someone isn't able to access internal resources, grab company data, and that kind of thing? So uh, technically speaking, I, I imagine you could say, yeah, I'll just break the machine and I'll do whatever I want with it. Well, that goes outside kind of the idea of the exam, doesn't it? Uh, one of the things that I did, though, was virtualize everything on my desktop. I'm not running iOS um, on, a, on a physical device. If you go out to the uh, Google for Android, you go out to Apple for iOS, you can download these developer kits, these software developer kits or SDKs. And if you just Google for Android SDK or iOS SDK, you'll find these. Uh, on the Android SDK is at developer.android.com, and it allows you to run the Android Software Developers Kit, including an emulator that you can run on your desktop, and you can run it Windows, you can run it Mac, you can run it in Linux. Obviously, one of the benefits of Android is that openness that they have associated with that. On iOS, a little bit different. There is a Software Developers Kit. I believe it still is free. Um, it's using something called Xcode, and you get that from developer.apple.com. And as you might expect, the Xcode software and the emulators will only work on Mac OS. So if you needed to create an application 
for your your iOS device. You wanted to build your own app, you got to start by running Mac OS X, Mac OS 10 on your desktop. And it looks something like this. It's pretty nifty on how, how it works. You've got this Xcode application. It's right here. This Xcode app is one that also gives me some options to, I'm going to open up a developer tool, which could be instruments, a printer simulator, file merging. There's an iOS simulator built right into it. So here we are. Now there's my iOS device. This is what I was using on that. So I can I can browse around. Obviously, I'm not updated to the latest version of Xcode with my emulator. Uh, but it has the same capabilities that you might have for anything else. If you are really using this device, you've even got the ability to virtually use your fingers to move things around the screen and pinch in and pinch out because these are mobile devices. And that's how I was able to show you those things on the video that I set up so that you could be able to, to see it a lot better. I have more control over it like that piece as well. So if you wanted to try it, you could absolutely go through that part and try it as well. Some nice capabilities there. There are a number of questions that come in about the A-plus exam. I realize we're at our past our one hour point, but I've got more questions for you. So thanks for holding on as we step through all of these. The questions that we came in really came in this month uh, were about these pieces in the chat room. They're already saying, wow, mobile devices. Wait a second. How much of the exam is that? Glad you asked. I'm about to answer some of these things for you. So let's talk about the exam itself. We have a question that said, how much time should we wait in between tests? I think Janiya is in the chat room. This is one of the things that I get asked a lot because it's it's often the first exam that somebody takes is their A-plus exam. And you may have never gone through an A-plus certification before. You may have never been in a situation where you've had to take an A-plus certification uh, or any type of certification. And what I generally tell people is that you can, um, it, some people will take both the exams the same day. And I'll generally say, uh, you don't want to do that unless you're really comfortable with the testing process. And of course, you know your content. Obviously, you wouldn't do that if you knew your content. You can take the 801 test first or the 802 test first. You can wait and take them back to back on the same day, or you can wait as long as you'd like to take the other one. And you can wait, I say as long as you like, up until the point where they retire the exam. So, for instance, if you had taken the 701 exam and now you're like, you know, I'd like to take my 702. Well, I'm sorry, they, they got retired at the end of last month. You can't take the 702 any longer. So that's something you have to keep in mind, but you can take as long as you would like between those particular exams. You don't have any particular time frame. Some people said, no, you have to take them within a year. Nope, you don't. You can take one this year. You can wait three years and take the next one if it's still available to take. As long as they're, they're logging it at CompTIA, they know you took the first one, you can wait as long as you want to to take the second one. So that's uh, an important consideration as well with those pieces. The um, Another question that, that came in is, all right, I'm ready to take the exam, but uh, how do I know if I'm really ready to take the exam? How do I know for sure that this exam is one that I'm going to walk into and know everything that's there? And it's really a multi-pronged process to be able to, to really get a feel for whether this is something that you're ready for or not. The first thing you should do is get the exam objectives. I say this every study group. Those of you that keep watching are sick and tired of me saying this, is get the objectives and read them. Now, I say this kind of, well, of course you get the objectives. Why wouldn't I get the objectives? It's remarkable and unfortunate how many people will send me a note or they'll come into the chat room on the website or they'll talk to me and they'll say, oh, I, I took my exam. I didn't do so well. Wasn't so great. I, I failed it. I said, well, well, gosh, which which section did you fail? Well, they asked me a lot of questions about mobile devices. Was not expecting that. But how? Well, did you download the objectives? Mm, no, didn't look through those. Didn't didn't try that. <laughs> so that's that's one of those things that uh, that I really recommend um, that you grab the objectives so you know what you're going to be asked. How could you not grab the objectives on this? Let's go over and look at. That's the wrong picture. That's the one I want to show you. This is the CompTIA.org website. I'm going to go uh, to certification, big tab at the top. Let's make it a little bigger so you guys can really see this. And I'm going to get certified in my A+. It's just a, a pull-down window right there. And on this page, 
there's an option on the right side that says, see what the exam covers. Well, that's exactly what I want to do. Get started now. The first thing when you get started is see what the exam covers. And it's going to ask you for some of your information. And I'm going to put my information in there. Type, 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 type. And what's nice about this is you could also put in and select as many exam objectives as you'd like into this mix. So I'm just going to choose A+, plus, and it's going to take me to the Get Exam Objectives page. The exam objectives themselves are, um, are pretty easy to work with. Um, they're very extensive. I get into um, looking at the exam objectives, and there's a lot of detail on the exam objectives that, that normally you wouldn't expect to get from other manufacturers or other, other certification providers. You can see that both the 701 and the 801, the 702 and the 802, they're all here because obviously the 700 is still being given in other parts of the world. Uh, but if we just click on, for instance, 802 objectives, it's going to bring up the objective list. Here it is. Let's make it nice and big. I'm running in Chrome. I think uh, a lot of these browsers these days will just show your PDF right on the screen, which makes it easy. Here's the breakdown. Mobile devices is 9% of the 802 exam. And this gives you a list, a bulleted list of everything you need to know. Now we were talking about mobile devices. That's the third one in. 1.0 One is operating systems. Ooh, look at all this information it gives just about operating systems. Let's keep going. Pages and pages. There, finally we're at 2.0, security. Let's go keep going, blah, blah, blah. Mobile devices, okay. 3.1, explain the basic features of mobile operating systems. For instance, the difference between Android 4.0 versus iOS 5.x. Um, and they, they interestingly enough, have added these version numbers in here uh, recently. The open source versus closed source, app source, screen orientation, screen calibration, GPS and geotracking. So I talked about where do you get the apps from? And that was one of the things, the reasons I asked the questions, they ask you that. So you should be able to go through this list and use it as a checklist. And when you can check as many of them off as you can, you're going to feel better about taking that exam. You should, of course, get a good book. You should get a good book that explains this app source. Don't just rely on my videos. Get some other resources as well. I like a lot of good Q&A books. Um, and at the top of the list of the, on the Professor Messer website, the top of my video list, I have a link to GTS Learning that has a link to their book. And they've taken their modules, they've put my videos right in the middle of them so you can watch the videos while you're reading the book as well, which is kind of a nice feature. You don't have to jump around and figure out where everything is. Um, all of it is in these objectives. Don't miss an opportunity to take advantage of those objectives. It's, it's disappointing, unfortunately, when people go through that process and they don't even think that something could have helped them out. Um, but obviously they do They do much better along those lines after it's done. To go back to a, a previous question before we go to this question from Elaine, uh, there was a question about the um, taking your test. You take one, then you take the other. And some of you had said, well, you, you have this three-year counter that when you get your certification, it's good for three years and you have to renew somewhere in that three-year process. Well, that's something that only starts, that clock only starts once you get the certification. So you have to pass both tests to get the certification. So the clock starts when you pass your second exam. That's when the three years starts on that piece. So hopefully that answers that question. So one of the questions on here uh, is, what do the performance-based A-plus questions look like? Oh, before I go through this, there's an interesting, interesting question in the chat room uh, that came up. Uh, that uh, I, I take this one. There's a couple of reasons that, that I like this question. Is, uh, have you had anyone learn other languages to be more marketable in IT? Jenny was asking this one in the chat room. Um, and not necessarily for the, the, the development part of it, um, but one of the things that is remarkable to me, um, and I don't know why it is, it really shouldn't be, but one of the things that's really happened in the last number of years is... is there's so much more blending now of what we're doing on the internet. Um, there are people on this chat and watching this feed right now from many different countries. Uh, one of the reasons I have transcripts on every single one of my videos and added the closed captioning to go along with what I'm saying is that a lot of the people that watch my videos aren't using, they, they're not people that know English as their first language. They're using it from another country that's not an English speaking country. So they're trying to follow along and and it's hard. They, they, they say, could you make the video and talk slower, that would be great. <laughs> well, I, I can't talk slower, 
uh, but I can put up the words. Um, and that's why I think knowing another language is incredibly valuable. Um, one of the jobs I used to have is one at a corporate level where I was, um, uh, and the corporation was worldwide. So I would have to go to France. I would have to go to Germany. I would have to go to Japan. I would have to go to Australia. And I almost knew how to talk to all of those. No, I didn't know how to talk to any of them, especially the Australians. The, the one that, um, but it didn't matter because they had the beer. Everybody has the beer. But the, the Australians were, uh, it seemed like the same language. I don't know. It was close. I didn't know J Japanese. I really didn't know French very well. Not enough to talk to somebody. Didn't know German. I know. My last name's Messer. I know no German. So you go into these countries and you can't communicate with them. It becomes a lot more of a challenge. So uh, from an IT perspective and really in general, if you know another language, Spanish, English, French, German, you know, get the big languages, you're going to do much better. I don't care what particular field of work you're going into. Um, there is uh, question number one on the list, it seems, is all about the new performance-based questions. Um, there is... Um, uh, a question about what they look like, question about the topics that will be asked of you, questions about how all of these things work together. And uh, there is a, a link that I have available. I should have put it on this page. But if you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash exam link, B-I-T dot L-Y slash exam link. Maybe someone will be nice enough to put that in the chat room. It takes you to a YouTube page that gives you an, an overview. I'm saying this, I'm stalling while I'm trying to get to the page. An overview of the process of the exam experience. Um, this is a, a video that really quite nicely over, how long is this video? 15 minutes long. Goes into the, not just performance-based questions, but what you can expect when you sit down to take the exam. Or... What type of questions should I expect when taking an exam? Well, sure, that's right. That's exactly what I thought you might say. This goes through screenshots. I'm going to try to fast forward on this. Here's what it looks like when you sit down and you're ready to take your exam. It goes through what you expect to read. And I'm going to fast forward up here. Here, for an example, is one of the performance-based exams. And we think some people say simulations. It's not necessarily simulations. This is an example of a simulation on the screen where you are at a command prompt and you have to type something. But they're not all, thankfully, they are, they are not all simulations. You will also see questions like this one. Let me fast forward to this one. That shows uh, drag and drop. So here's something on the left side. You need to drag and drop over the thing on the right side. And these are things you should know. You don't have to plan for this. You don't have to study for that. You should know what which one of these connects a mouse and which one of these is an audio device. I bet most of the people that are on here right now can answer that one. Which one of these is for a mouse and which one's for an audio device? Hmm. Now, granted, this is an incredibly difficult question, but we can see the TRS plug here is used for audio. The USB is probably what we'd use for a mouse. So those types of of questions kind of easy when you start thinking about how to how to use them. I'm sure the question, the content of the questions themselves can get relatively complex, but this video will take you through all of those pieces. So I I I use that example to go out. And if you're just trying to find it on YouTube, you can't remember what was that bit.ly link? Just look for the candidate experience or or CompTIA candidate experience and it will find that for you on YouTube. Nice 15 minute, it's worth the time to sit down. If you've never stepped through one of those exams before, uh, very, very useful to, to have that available. So a good question from, from Elaine. A question from Dion, are there any lesser certifications you'd recommend as a good ramp up to the A plus? And after passing the A plus, are there certifications you would say are a natural progression to the next step? Really, it's a good question um, and being able to do that. Um, there, there are certainly lesser certifications that you can deal with. Uh, those lesser certifications are some from CompTIA themselves. Um, there are others from, from other manufacturers as well. And, and generally, I see people taking those exams or studying for those exams not because they want to put that exam on their resume, on their CV, but they want to be ready for the A+. So you would have to really be somebody who's never touched a computer before who would want to go through those. Things like, for, for instance, Microsoft has their MTA 
exams or certifications. Those MTA are the entry level for those particular pieces. Um, not bad. I think most people could really jump into the A plus and do pretty well. I don't think you have to. There's some environments, especially in educational facilities and some uh, some uh, organizations require that you take that before you take the A plus. So you may be forced into doing that. And it's really not a bad idea if you really do want a very good primer prior to jumping into something like the A plus certification. So the big question I get all the time, though, is the second part of this. After passing the A plus, what's the next step? And it's really up to you. I think part of what we deal with from a technological perspective is there's so many places you can go with this. You could go into networking. You could go into security. You could do database management. You could do data center management. Maybe you want to deal only with operating systems. Maybe you want to do routing and switching. Um, there are certifications um, for virtualization. For you just keep going and going and going. There are there's already I just named five six different areas of expertise. Once you have your A plus, you might want to look going into some of those areas. I think I've also said uh, some things that that. I have often found that when I'm working with anything in IT, it's plugged into the network. So I often tell people, if you have your A+, get your network plus because you can use that whatever you do. Some people just decide, no, I'm just going to go right to Microsoft. I'm going to go right to VMware. I'm going to go right to another, another type of platform. That's fine, too. Uh, but the networking piece, I think, can really, really help you going forward. That kind of piece becomes, becomes really, really useful. Well, we have, we have gone through well over an hour of questions and answers. I appreciate everybody joining us today. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at ProfessorMesser.com slash Twitter. I mentioned that if you really want to help support the site, I don't take donations in a monetary form, but I'll absolutely take your subscriptions at ProfessorMesser.com slash YouTube. GTS Learning, just to give you a, rem a reminder that you've got uh, an hour of free time that you can use on ProfessorMesser.com slash Freestyle Labs. Some of you that are ready to take your exam, there's also voucher discounts available on the Professor Messer website at professormesser.com slash vouchers. Again, thanks to GTS Learning. They're the ones that have sponsored that. Um, very nice to have that there. That takes you right to uh, CompTIA. Use them during your CompTIA checkout. So it's nice to have that there as well. And of course, I do these groups uh, every month for A+, every month for Network+. Plus. If you're planning to join us next week, we're going to do one of these for Network+. Plus and get those going as well. And if there was more time in the week, I'd be able to do more of them. Maybe we can make something like that happen in the future. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We'll see you next time on the Professor Messer A-plus study group.